Now we turn our attention to the news late on Friday night. The reprieve, or skipping, shall we say, of the Moody's rating review on South Africa. A lot of people expected a downgrade. It didn't happen. The credit rating agency was due to make the big announcement, but did not release a rating or any statement regarding the delay. Now this leaves South Africa's credit rating at BAA3, just one notch above junk status. Now for more, more on what this reprieve means for South Africa, I'm joined in studio by Sanisha Pakirisami, a chief economist at Momentum Investment, Michelle Wahlberg, a bond analyst at Rand Merchant Bank, as well as via Skype in London with Peter Attard Montalto, the head of capital markets research at Intellidex. And I think if I start off with you, Peter, in London, um, in many ways, uh, this has been described as uh, not so much a repeat, but a, a sword of Damocles hanging over our chests here. How do you view it from there? Well, exactly. I mean, South Africa has been denied its cathartic moment, basically, of knowing either way. This is not an affirmation of the rating. It's just nothing, basically. Um, and that sort of denies National Treasury the opportunity to send out one of their usual statements after a ratings affirmation saying, here's what we're doing on reform, um, etc. Um, and also, given it wasn't an affirmation of the rating, it also means that Moody's can kind of move at any time now. Uh, if they'd affirmed the rating on Friday, it would have really meant it was, it was hard without a meaningful shock then to move for a, another six months. But still, it seems like the sense of release in South Africa, I think locals in particular were far too, um, or were signing far too high a probability of an actual downgrade, whilst uh, investors offshore were much, much more sceptical um, that the rating would be cut. Well, coming back to the studio here, Sanisha, um Originally, what was your what was your reaction on late Friday when you stayed up with the rest of us to find out what had happened? Uh, thank you. Um, so, well, we know that there are two ratings dates that Moody's can announce. So that was going to be the 29th of March and the 1st of November. Um, and they do comply with the EU regulations, which means that they don't have to release a rating on the day, which, of course, they chose not to do. And South Africa was in the company of a number of other countries which also didn't get their rating review, including the likes of Zambia and Cyprus, including in that. Just one question before we talk about bonds. I mean, how cataclysmic or otherwise would it be if Moody's finally the last ratings agency says, that's it, you guys are junk. I mean, how are we going to see it coming through to business here? Well, the major fear really is our inclusion in the World Government Bond Index, also known as the WIGB. And uh, that essentially means that once we lose our investment grade status, there are foreigners that will not uh, be allowed to hold our bonds any longer. And if we have this massive outflow of bonds from South Africa, it could have a negative repercussion for the currency, which could then have a repercussion for inflation, lower growth. There might be a push to actually increase interest rates in that kind of environment. It could also smash confidence. Now, we need to also be aware that last year there was quite a significant outflow of bonds anyway which means that a lot of the bad news may already be factored into the price of bonds. Uh, we also need to consider that there could be some offset. So even though there could be some outflows of bonds, there could be a situation where South Africa then becomes the least ugly from the ugly sisters in terms of then becoming a part of the higher yielding currencies. And in that kind of environment, we might see some inflows into South Africa where we look relatively good across uh, the EM spectrum. Uh, uh, Michelle, um, we've been talking about the bonds um, for quite some time in this show now, the bond market. So uh, there's all these kind of scary stories in the paper saying companies will be pulling out hundreds of millions if this final downgrade happens. How far true is that? So it's definitely a big concern. I think we, as a country, it, it's very hard to estimate how much will actually flow out of the country. Um, you've got passive funds that track um, the WIGB and those have to those funds have to go out as soon as we are downgraded. And then you've got your, your more active funds that don't have to downgrade um, or don't have to get out of the country on the day. So I think with Moody's, the big thing wasn't necessarily a downgrade, but the fact that our outlook might change to negative. And with that outlook changing to negative, you have a lot of people, those active fund managers that will get out of the country. Um, so we, it, was a, it was really interesting to see the price action on Friday because we also had an increase in the, the JP Morgan EM bond index for South Africa. So a lot of guys were sitting on their hands waiting to see what would happen. But there, has, there was a large inflow into the country. I think we had to increase bond 
turnover by around 8 billion, the cash that came into the, the country. And we saw that flow happen through late on Friday afternoon. Um, and we saw a lot of the rally that we were expecting this morning um, that ar already happened on Friday afternoon. And um, it's, it's been mentioned as well that um, earlier on the show that the, the bond market has already priced this in. Um, to so really, even if on November the 1st, then the, the downgrade still happens, yeah. um, that the bond markets are not going to be that unhappy here. I think it all depends on what happens post-elections. I think Moody's will probably give us the benefit of the doubt till after elections, and then we not need to see things fall into place. You know, we need to start seeing a, a turnaround plan for ESCOM. Um, the fiscal pic picture needs to ha look a lot better. So I think Moody's can pull the trigger any time from now. Um, as, as Peter said, you know, you don't have a certain set time. Um, so I think the bond market will trade very lightly. Um, I don't think we'll see a, a conviction as to the direction of bonds. I think until we receive an actual um, yes or no from Moody's, we'll be in l a bit of a limbo. So Peter, going back to you in, in London, um, the international perspective on what's going on here, what are people saying there about uh, the latest data and the possibility of a downgrade on November the 1st? Well, I think everyone's found the whole narrative somewhat repetitive, if you like. It feels like we're back at the end of uh, 2017 on this, will they, won't they? And Moody's has spent a lot of time talking to international investors uh, over the last sort of two months or so. And I think the more that they talk to investors, the more exasperated investors have actually got with the way Moody's is thinking about things. Um, and there basically is this constant sort of mean reversion narrative um, where basically Moody's, I think, in particular around, say, load shedding, um, is sort of viewing this as a one-off, um, if you like, um, not affecting long-term growth, uh, whereas investors are actually taking a more um, sceptical view. So the rating certainly is very important for particularly those passive uh, funds that got mentioned, but actually the analysis that Moody's is providing uh, is being relied on less and less by the market as a, a sort of guide to what's going to happen in South Africa. I think people, the market in general, is a lot more bearish uh, than Moody's on things like the impact of load shedding on growth um, the impact of, of what's going to come after the election in terms of uh, reform potential uh, and things like that. So I think overall international investors, you know, given a pretty healthy real yield here, feel they have to be involved to, to a degree. But no one is particularly, I think, loving on South Africa uh, at this state but, uh, and at the moment before elections. So, Sonny, sure, there's, uh, there's a case in point. Elections coming up next month. A question I have is that what it seems to be like a downward spiral what do you think economically could pull this country out of this spiral? We really need to start doing structural reforms. I think that's the one thing that could potentially even lift ratings in the longer term. If we start to see the implementation of structural reforms, improving the cost of doing business uh, by lowering those costs that make it so punitive for businesses, improving confidence, making sure that we have enough competition in both the labor and the product markets, um, the International Monetary Fund has set out a number of recommendations last year in November for South Africa to take to, to heart. And I think if we do some of these things, we can actually pull South Africa's growth trajectory higher over time. Of course, in the short term, we do have the issue of the load shedding, and that is likely to compromise growth in the short term. And just going to uh, Michelle, I mean, there's an IF IMF report coming out on Wednesday, which might give us a clearer picture. Overall, um, what are the bond traders of South Africa saying at the moment amongst yourselves? So I think South Africans are very close to the challenges that South Africa faces. And something like load shedding, if you're sitting in your office and the lights go out, you're a lot more inclined to be negative about how this plays out. Um, having, a looking, having a look at how Moody's methodology plays out, you can actually see why they haven't pulled the trigger as yet because on their methodology, we should, we should be stable at, and still investment grade. So I think the locals seem to say, okay, cool, but based on all the bad things that have happened, you know, where ESCOM's sitting, um, all the state corruption, we should have been put on negative watch a long time ago. So I think local investors are still very cautious. I think. If you have a look at bonds, if you look at the 186 benchmark bond, um, any yield above 9% starts, uh, starts adding value. And I think that's where they'll say, OK, cool. Even though it, I have to invest in South Africa, that is where um, 
that's where I'm going to get my yield. Um, so any yields above 9% that I think is a good buy, even around 8 to 80, um, and anything lower than that, uh, around 8 50, 8 40, 8 30, I think that's where they'll start lightening up and positioning. Um, and that's what we've seen. So I think guys are busy playing the range, um, still cautious on South Africa. I think the moment you have low shedding, we'll see the RAND weaken and we'll see bonds weaken because people feel it. And as they feel it, they, they uh, lighten up and positioning. But um, if things are as is, they like it, yeah. We'll go back to Peter in London. Uh, Peter, I mean, despite the fact we have power cuts, we have low growth, we still, um, the country is trying to deal with this corruption. There are good signs. We have a state capture hearing. We've got a new head of the uh, tax revenue collection agency here. Uh, what's the feeling in London? Did, is the feeling that South Africa may be struggling now and on the right track, or is it otherwise? Well, I think the problem that uh, a lot of investors have, particularly the ones who travel to South Africa very regularly, is actually seeing where the route out of this is in the medium run. Um, and that comes back to sort of this repetitive issue that all, as just got mentioned, all the, the you know policy remedies are fully known. Everyone knows that they've been on the table. Um, I always say that in the union buildings, there is a filing cabinet somewhere with all these reports that says exactly what should be done to, uh, to turn around growth and turn around the economy and things are not being done. And that's why the hot topic for me at the moment, a lot of discussions I'm having with investors really around the fundamental way the state functions or dysfunctions or doesn't function. Uh, and that's where I remain quite skeptical after the elections, really, of if that machine is really going to be turned around, given the lack of capacity in the state. I think a lack of understanding of really how to move um, you know, recalcitrant departments like Home Affairs into line on things like visas, uh, how to put in place you know, a minister who is business friendly at DTI uh, when the current, you know, forerunner to take over from uh, Rob Davis is probably Ibrahim Patel. Um, so I think really investors are sort of slightly stuck, if you like, to really find the way out of this. Uh, and especially after the election, when you add on, uh, you know, the start of a sort of existential fight and factionalism uh, within the ruling party uh, as well. So um, in that sense, the, we're stuck in this sort of sticky narrative. And that, that's the real challenge for investors. Well, thank you very much, Peter Attard Montalto, the head of Capital Markets Research at Intellidex, coming to us live from London there. And also in the studio, thank you very much to Michelle Wahlberg, a bond analyst at Rand Merchant Bank, as well as Sanisha Pakirisami, a chief economist at Momentum.